Hi, my name is Jason. I worked with Amir Ansari and Dominic Maori. All three of us worked in the lab of Dr. Mark Myers, professor at Chafee College. We did something called elliptical Fourier analysis of the ulnar proximal complex in primates, which is a mouthful. If you stick around, I'll explain exactly what all that entails. Uh, if you want to cut to the punchline, because there's a TLDR on this, the proximal complex of the ulna differs across primate species. It's not very surprising, but we were actually able to quantify it in some interesting ways. There's a QR code here on the poster, so if you want to take a picture of it or follow it using your phone, you can go to a website we've set up that will continue updating as we continue working on this project. So a little bit about this first. What's an ulnar proximal complex? The ulnar proximal complex is the name that we came up for uh, for the part of the ulna, which is a bone in your forearm, that basically makes up most of your elbow joint. So if you look at the lower left-hand side of this poster, you're gonna see that there's three distinct parts of the ulnar complex. There's something called the olecranon process, which is denoted here by A, something called the semilunar notch, or you may see it called the trochlear notch, which is probably more accurate, this little divot right here, and that's where it interfaces with the humerus, one of the places that the bone interfaces with the humerus. And then this flat little piece of bone here called the radial notch, that's where the ulna and the radius uh, articulate together. We theorized at the beginning of this that the ulnar proximal complex would differ across different groups of animals, specifically in our case, the primates. And so to work on that, what we did, and most of the work for this project actually was, we harvested a bunch of images of ulnar proximal complexes from different species of animals, mostly primates. Um, that involved the three of us going to Morphosaurus, downloading 3D uh, data, and then screenshotting it so that we could actually get the shape of what that looked like in each of the different specimens we were looking at. We took that data after, I think that was probably the first real half of the project where we were just gathering data, and then we did something called elliptical Fourier analysis. It's a very complicated mathematical uh, analysis. I can't pretend like I actually understand it. I understand the general gist of how it works. So kind of think about it like it's a way for us to quantify how different shapes are from each other. So a lot of the work that went inside is we had to align the specimens the same way. They had to all kind of be facing the same way. They had to be standardized in, in terms of how long or how wide the picture was so that the computer didn't get confused and think that something was way bigger and something way smaller because we're really just interested in looking at what the shape of the bone was. And so we plugged hundreds of specimens into a program called Shape, which does something called elliptical for does the elliptical Fourier analysis. And it provided us with a file that we could then take into a secondary analysis called principal components analysis. Principal components analysis is a very, it's actually classic at this point, classic method used to reduce the dimensionality of data. And basically what that means is it takes really complicated data and it tells you what parts of that data are important for determining how the specimens inside your data differ. So it turns out something called principal components. We had three fairly good principal components. The first two were very good, and that's usually how it works. Your first few principal components are really good, and then they start getting kind of lower and lower in quality as they go through the process. Um, and so what we did was we used those principal components to compare against some different things, and we did use that in our analysis. So we did all of this computer work to basically get us to the point where we could say, all right, how different are all the specimens that we have from each other? And so if you look over at our results, you're going to see that there are a couple of things that we picked out of it. And, and to be perfectly fair, the work that we're doing with this analysis is still ongoing. But the first couple of really great insights that we got from this data set were, one, that the best predictor of what the olecranon uh, sorry, the ulnar proximal complex was going to look like in a specimen is actually based on body mass. And so if you look at our first graph here, you're going to see that we plotted log body mass against the first uh, principal component. So it says PC1, PC, that second PC stands for proximal complex. And you're going to see there's a relationship there um, doing a linear regression, sorry, at least squares regression. Uh, and you can see that the data and the line follow each other fairly well, which means it's a pretty good predictor. Body mass is a pretty good predictor of what your proximal complex is going to look like. 
And then the second thing that we got is that if we took the first two proximal complex, uh, sorry, first two proximal complex principal components and plotted them against each other, we got pretty decent separation of the groups of animals we're looking at in the primates by how they locomote. So locomotion describes how an animal moves about. We would theorize that animals use their ulnates move about if they're walking on all fours or if they're climbing or swinging from branch to branch, that, that, that there might be a difference in morphology that actually let us see how do these animals uh, move differently just by looking at the proximal complex of the ulna. And so as you can see in the second picture, we get pretty good separation. Those colored areas are something called a convex hole. They're basically just drawing in different points of our data. We didn't draw them around the green one because as you see, it's gonna overlap and it would get pretty messy. And toward the right center of the graph, we start getting some overlap, but branching out from there, you get fairly decent separation, which means it's doing a pretty good, not an awesome, but a pretty good job of separating those groups based on what the proximal complex in the ulna looks like. So we did all that. Like I said, we're still kind of working through some of it. We're looking at doing some different analyses, but basically what this showed us was A, body mass is a really great predictor of what your proximal complex is going to look like on the ulna. B, what your proximal complex looks like predicts kind of well, at least on the first two principal components, what you're going to do when you're moving around, like what kinds of things you can do. And then we kind of stop there. We're looking at moving in some other, we didn't stop. We're looking at moving into some different directions and seeing about comparing this against other kinds of animals. So animals outside of the primates to see how do primates compare against things like antelopes or buffalo or rhinoceros or something like that to see how different that is because Primate locomotion is very different. Primates use a lot of different methods to get about, right? Walk on all fours or climb trees. A couple of the other things that I mentioned, but some other animals are very much stuck in one mode of uh, locomotion. So for example, I mentioned a rhinoceros. Rhinoceroses basically just run around on all fours. So they're quadrupeds, they're terrestrial, they don't climb trees, just to help they don't, or anything like that. And so that's where we're going to be going in the future with this. Like I said, if you want to keep up with it, um, the QR code in the middle of our poster is going to have, uh, it's linked to a website and we're going to continue to update it as we add more information. If you have any questions, uh, we're happy to take them. You can email me um, at jason.jung at csusb.edu. I'm happy to take your emails or to refer them to anybody else in the group. Um, thanks for watching this presentation. We'd like to thank our sponsors for the Chafee SRO for uh, to thank Linda Lamp for all the hard work that she's done, and especially to Dr. Mark Meyer for making this possible for the three of us. Thank you and have a great fall.